In this video, I'm going to talk about fuses, circuit breakers, PTCs, and in general, any device that's meant to prevent your circuit from going up in smoke. I will answer all these questions in this video, so if any of these questions are what you're wondering about, then please continue watching. Now, if you're planning on making circuits that run off of batteries, you might be wondering if you really need any circuit protection at all. After all, most people know that batteries are a lot safer than wall outlet power, right? Well, yes and no. They are safer in the sense that you can't really get shocked by them. If you try to lick a 9 volt battery, I guarantee you, you'll feel it and it won't be pleasant. But even that's not dangerous. But some of this has more to do with simply protecting your circuit from further damage in the event of a failure. Take for example this circuit. In this circuit, you see that there's a microcontroller driving a transistor which is in turn turning a motor on and off based on some signal from somewhere. And it's running on regular batteries and the circuit is functioning normally at the moment and everything's fine. But let's say something went wrong, like for instance, a winding shorted out in your motor. Well, let's consider our little circuit again. You'll see that the transistor is getting quite hot. And unless you do something about this right away, the transistor is probably going to end up breaking. Yep, as predicted, the shorted motor caused an epic failure. The magic smoke in the transistor that makes it work was released through a microscopic crack that was created when it heated up. All joking aside, the transistor is fried. Also, under an overload or short circuit condition, the batteries can get dangerously hot. And here's why. Every battery has, an, has a different internal impedance, in other words, resistance. This causes a certain degree of heat to be generated depending on the amount of load the battery is placed under. In most cases, this resistance is negligible. For example, if I draw uh, half an amp from this set of six AA batteries, I get 4.5 watts dissipated across the entire battery holder. So the batteries might get noticeably warm, but it's not a big deal. Now let's say some kind of a short circuit occurred, or an overload, either by some kind of an accident, or a component failure. Let's see what happens. <coughs> Holy cow! If you do all the math, you'll see that the batteries are going to be generating 112.5 watts under a short circuit. Under that kind of heat, the batteries could go... <laughs> Obviously, you don't want that to happen, but you're in luck, because fuses and fuse holders are pretty darn cheap. And if you ask me, when you consider the potential consequences of not including a fuse, in my opinion, you can't afford not to have them. But how do you choose the right fuse for a homemade device? It's actually quite simple. The first thing you do is break the circuit, and then insert your ammeter in series with it and then turn the power back on. You'll see that this circuit, since this circuit draws 0.45 amps, which is almost half an amp, you'd want to use a half amp fuse. In general, you may want your fuse to be just slightly higher than your device's normal load because there just may not be a fuse that's rated for the exact amount of amps that your device draws. And also, a lot of devices have a bit of a surge when they first turn on from filter capacitors charging up or from motors starting if the device has a motor in it. But if there's a big surge, you might find that your circuit blows its fuse every now and again, even though it's working properly and you think you rated the fuse based on what the ammeter said. But the ammeter might not have responded quickly enough to show that surge of current when it first turned on, or you might not have been paying attention when you were first turning the switch on. Using a bigger fuse might solve the problem, but then your circuit won't be protected as well. 
If you've ever wondered what a slow blow fuse is for, now you know. A slow blow fuse allows a temporary overload, but it blows if there's ever a sustained overload, which would happen during an actual device failure. But a fuse only protects against excessive current. It doesn't necessarily help in the event of an overvoltage event or in the event that you accidentally hook your power supply up the wrong way. Also the other thing is that a fuse needs to be replaced when it fails because the wire melts. Circuit breakers can be reset but I don't know if they exist under the kind of ratings that you need for a battery powered circuit. Also even if your battery could deliver that amount of current safely, I don't even know if a circuit breaker designed for house current would even trip under like say 12 volts at 20 amps. But PTCs are available in those lower amp ratings, and they're designed for low voltage circuits. PTCs are reusable just like circuit breakers. That is, when the fault is removed, they can be reset and used again. In fact, they actually reset themselves. As you can see, a PTC is about the size of your average ceramic resistor, and they're not that much more expensive than traditional fuses. And here's how it works. At the heart of a PTC is a material that changes resistance based on heat. PTC stands for positive temperature coefficient. The resistance goes up when the heat goes up. When the current goes above the trip current rating, the PTC's resistance rises substantially, limiting the current. When the fault is fixed or the power is removed, the PTC cools down and the resistance returns to normal. In other words, the PTC actually resets itself. But it still only protects against excessive current, not excessive voltage. Overvoltage might occur if, for example, you use the wrong AC adapter or the voltage regulator failed. Now if the regulator failed open, the chips would just have no power. If it failed shorted to ground, it would blow the fuse, hopefully. If there isn't a fuse, your power supply will explode. But if it failed shorted to its output, everything running off of the regulator would now see the full DC voltage input of your entire device, which could fry every chip. But if we had something that conducted over a certain voltage, we could short out the power supply when the voltage is too high and blow the fuse assuming you've included one. Otherwise, this would do more harm than good. But anyway, what I'm talking about is known as a Zener diode. A Zener diode will conduct forwards just like a regular diode, but it will block backwards current up to a certain voltage, and then it will allow current to flow. Take this circuit, for example. The 5.6 volt Zener diode is reverse biased. At 3 volts, it doesn't turn on but at 9 volts it turns on and the light goes on. So you might think a Zener diode alone would provide over voltage protection in the manner that we discussed. So let's see what happens when the regulator shorts out in this circuit. Instead of getting 9 volts on the chip's output, the Zener diode begins to conduct freely and shorts out the power supply rails of the 5 volt, now 9 volt power supply. This would create a short circuit condition which in theory should blow the fuse and leave everything else unharmed once the regulator is replaced. Well, the fuse blew, but the Zener diode failed. And here's why. Well, the Zener diode can only handle about 500 milliwatts of heat being dissipated across it. So let's do the math and figure out what kind of heat we were dissipating across the Zener diode. Since the Zener diode is shorting out the power supply, the only thing we have to worry about is its own internal impedance. According to Ohm's law, we get 0.8 amps. Let's see how many watts that gets us by doing volts times amps. So now you can see that that would totally overpower the Zener diode and it would just melt. But we can use the Zener diode to trigger something else called an SCR. SCRs can be used in pairs to switch full wave AC on and off. But once they're on, they can't be turned off again by the gate until zero crossing. Which is why they don't really work on DC because it would only be able to turn it on, it wouldn't be able to turn it back off again. 
but they can handle a heck of a lot more amps than most Zener diodes, and they don't really need to be able to turn off once they get triggered, because once they get triggered, they short out the power supply and blow the fuse anyhow, which would cut off the power. So here's an overvoltage protection circuit using an SCR and a Zener diode, along with some other components. The 10K resistor pulls the gate to ground when it's not triggered. The capacitor makes sure that only a sustained overvoltage will trigger it. And by sustained, I mean just a few milliseconds, because tiny little transients may occur that are actually less than a few milliseconds, more like a few microseconds, that don't need to trigger the circuit, because these spikes are normal, and they're quite small, and they're over relatively quickly, so they wouldn't harm your ICs in the first place. And plus the Zener diode along with the capacitor would absorb little momentary spikes like that. Anything that wouldn't be absorbed by the capacitor alone would fire the SCR, shorting out the power supply and blowing the fuse, thus protecting your circuit from any over-voltage conditions. Here's a circuit diagram of an SCR over-voltage protection device. I'm sure there's ICs available that are made for the purpose of over-voltage protection, but SCRs are relatively cheap, and they can handle the short circuit current unlike a Zener diode. Remember, the SCR only has to handle it for like a few milliseconds, because the fuse is going to blow pretty much instantaneously under a short circuit. Even if the SCR did fail, the cost of replacing it would be a lot less than the cost of potentially replacing all the integrated circuits in your whole machine. One thing I haven't covered is why there was a diode in my power supply. Well, reversing power on an integrated circuit or on an electrolytic capacitor that's polarized is usually not a good thing. A diode only allows current to flow one way, so if you connect the power backwards by mistake, the diode will simply not conduct and no damage will be done. If you're trying to protect something that draws a lot of amps, I would recommend checking out Afrotech Mods video about PFET reverse voltage protection. You could also arrange the diode like this, reverse bias across the power input so it normally doesn't conduct, but it'll actually short out the power supply if it's connected backwards and trip whatever recurrent limiting device you have in your circuit, whether that be a fuse, a PTC, circuit breaker, whatever. Just don't set it up this way if you don't have current limiting. Doing that would lead to epic failure. So hopefully now you know a little bit more about how to protect your circuit from going <laughs>If you'd like me to make another video about controlling and protecting electric motors, relays, and solenoids, please go ahead and leave a comment, and I will do so. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. Please go ahead and leave a comment, just don't be a jerk.